Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Singh, our program director. Good morning to you all. Tumelang, Fuyamore, Sanbunan, Mulueni, Nda, Tobe, Neha, Bonju, Omansava. Well, it looks like uh, Professor Singh, um, I've lost some of my delegates at this point. I just want to greet our minister, Minister Blake Nzimande, the Minister for Education and Training in South Africa, uh, Minister Reza Muridi, the Minister of Research, Innovation, Colleges, Universities and Training in Ontario, Canada, as well as your deputy ministers who are with, uh, with you here, uh, Minister. Our president of the ICDE, Professor Dian Belawati, and all the members of the executive of ICDE, members of the UNISA Council, led by the acting chairperson of the council, Dr. Mukoni Matabane, thank you so much for being here. Um, the presidents of all our organizations who are gathered with us here this morning, the Commonwealth of Planning, uh, the OEC, Open Educational Consortium, the African Council for Decent Education, and all the councils that are here with us this morning. Presidents, vice chancellors, rectors, distinguished delegates, good morning once more and welcome. I want to welcome you with this short message that I've titled, New Paradigms for Higher Education. Sustainable higher education post-2015 must focus on the trinity of quality pedagogy, quality governance, and quality leadership. So good morning and my deepest, sincerest, and warmest welcome to South Africa, Sun City, and the 26th ICTE World Conference. I do not believe that I had a prouder day than this morning, standing here with you. This is one of the most important conferences for all of us involved in higher education, and I want to express my gratitude to you who accepted our invitation to share and to participate in this conference. We have, as Professor Singh indicated, almost 900 delegates from 67 countries, and every one of you is most welcome. UNISA is very proud to host the 26th ICTE World Conference, as well as the President's Summit on behalf of the ICTE. Delegates will note the rich tapestry of speakers that were woven together to ensure that both programs, the World Conference and the President's Summit, complement each other. However, you will also note distinctions as with the World Conference, we hone in on the important issues around growing capacities for provision, whilst at the President's Summit, there is a sharper emphasis on leadership and the emerging discourse on governance in higher education. Underpinning both meetings are the principles of sustainable quality higher education. I unhesitatingly share my view that education is the epicenter of nation building and development as it undergirds the global aspiration for better societies. Therefore, I want to open with a question which I hope will find an answer over the next three days. Are our universities fit for the future? Are university leaders attuned to the emerging developments? Do we have adequate resources, that is skills, capacities, expertise, and funds to achieve the aspirations of higher education? Well, I suppose these were three questions rather than one. And as we discuss universities and colleges, I want us to challenge ourselves to broaden our thinking to the opportunities of an integrated, articulated post-school system. I believe that if there is a consideration for broadening access and absorption into post-school education, then universities alone will not be the answer. The sustainability of higher education in the post-2015 agenda will require a leadership cater 
who have multidisciplinary talents. They will need to understand issues such as public governance and be able to integrate the academic project, accountability, institutional autonomy, and quality to the best effect within the university environment. I am still grappling with whether governance is in fact one of the facets of quality imperative, or whether quality is attained when a good governance framework is in place. Governance, on the other hand, is aimed at ensuring transparency and accountability of the leadership of the university and monitoring and maintaining oversight of the university management. On the other hand, it seeks to maximize institutional performance, success and sustainability in the context of the mission and strategy of the university. Thirdly, it ensures stakeholder management, representation and democracy in the way the university is led and managed. However, with the introduction of governance imperatives into the university environment, there is an emerging demand for regulation, administration, management, reporting, risk and compliance regimens hitherto not foregrounded. A critical debate currently taking place is whether the focus on governance in higher education has come at a cost of innovation, creativity, and academic autonomy. On the other hand, the massification of education has resulted in universities increasing in size. Regulation of the university has moved from centralization to a decentralized supervisory framework from government, which has resulted in more responsibilities at the institutional level. The increasing devolution has given rise to the so-called evaluative state with the ensuing demands for performance management and accountability. Further, accusations of waste and inefficiency coupled with a generally declining economic state of affairs have resulted in institutions becoming more entrepreneurial in their operations, significantly increasing both the complexity of the organization and the potential for wayward behavior. Combined, this demands a more professional approach to governance. This is of competing paradox, but I'm most going to suggest that universities can balance the two and actualize the benefits of good governance without compromising the academic project, institutional autonomy, and academic freedom. It just requires new ways of thinking. Which actually then brings me to the second issue, what is the academic project? Plato said many years ago that if education is to make a real difference, it must be underpinned by critical values of ethical leadership and citizenship. Is that still a positive? I've had the challenge that today's graduates exit the university with an understanding of the subjects taught, but little else. So I make the inquiry whether it is the university's role to develop students into engaged and responsible citizens or good people? Or is it the lecturer's function to produce a discipline-specific expert? Again, can we achieve a balance and score on both sides? Thirdly, let us recognize a central pillar of quality, which reflects on both the academic project and the sustainability of the university. A critical concern in the provision of learning is how to provide in a manner that reaches the greatest number of people whilst ensuring a quality offering. Open distance online learning is sometimes seen as a panacea for massification and the opportunity to bridge geographic distances. However, experience dictates that there are many factors that influence the achievement of the optimal state. For example, is it a non-negotiable that open distance learning systems must be coupled with res responsible access, success, and increased throughput? As we become increasingly focused on the online and e-learning modalities, students must be equipped to take advantage of the affordances of technology. I dare say that sometimes we make assumptions, for example, that because our students can competently use gadgets like smartphones and games, they can also use them for study purposes. This is a misnomer. Students need to learn how to study online and at a distance. Therefore, student support is critical, and without it, 
more detailed insight into the pedagogy of e-learning success and throughput will remain a challenge. Coupled with this, when e-learning is proposed, the available infrastructure, including bandwidth, networks, connectivity constraints, and costs are vital considerations. Without doubt, in the post-2015 agenda, learning needs to be revitalized in the context of the e-learning model to facilitate student interactions in virtual learning environments, support, assessment, and media-enriched learning and teaching. Universities must begin to design the learning environment more as an ecosystem rather than simply a curriculum. Universities must know their students and students' profiling and business intelligence are becoming increasingly important. Data analytics today enables far more nuanced systemic information that can guide both policy options and development interventions, and we should be using it much more. Finally, I want to suggest the pivotal factor in achieving the post-2015 agenda for post-school education in the academic leadership that one understands and subscribes to the principles of care and respect for the students, and two, that the will to make a difference. What I would really like to see is a global research project where universities participate in an assessment exercise to gauge their standing in the thematic areas of governance, academic innovation and e-learning, student support and quality. The results should be shared amongst the participating institutions and individual institutions and colleges must use them to identify collaboration partners for growth and development. I leave you with a final consideration that influenced the theme of this 26th ICD conference, which you will all know by now, but in case you have forgotten, I will repeat it. Growing capacities for sustainable distance e-learning provision. What is the true uptake and capability of universities and colleges today to successfully deliver the scale and quality of services required in higher education and to take on the new responsibilities and occupy new spaces in a sustainable manner. I leave you with this question, and I would like to thank you for give, giving you these opening remarks. And at this point, I would like to introduce our minister, Minister Bongingosi Emmanuel, commonly known in this country as Minister Blade Nzimande. This is the Minister for Higher Education and Training in our country. Minister Nzimande hails from Peter Marisbeck um, in an area known as Guadambuza. Grew up there, pursued his primary education in that area, as well as pursued his higher and secondary education. Beyond there, he went to the University of Zululand, where he pursued his junior degree studies. And after passing those studies, the interesting thing with the minister is that he had a short stint as a, a journalist with uh, the newspaper known as uh, the Natal Witness, based in Peter Marisbeck. Then he pursued his studies beyond that. Um, he has qualifications in psychology as well as sociology, but he went further to pursue his studies at the then University of Natal, where he obtained his PhD in sociology. Minister Nzimande has taught both at the University of Zululand as well as the University of Natal then, which is now the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He was the director of the Education Policy Unit for a very long time until the dawn of our democracy, where he then left the university operations to be in parliament, where he led the education portfolio committee as the chairperson. But besides that, it's very interesting that uh, the minister's history is so exciting because he served as a member of council at the universities that at that time were in transition. Both our University of South Africa, which was in transition at the time under the leadership of uh, one of our former principal and vice chancellors, Professor Bani Pijana, we were actually going through some turmoil at the time but I would not like to bore you with that. But it was interesting to understand the work that he did because there were times as a member of council, he would be standing up to say, this meeting is not continuing unless the following has happened. So which was very interesting in those dynamics 
but he also served in the, at the then University of Transkei, which was also uh, going through its own transition, currently known as the Walter Sisulu University. And as they say, he was then appointed in the new Ministry of Higher Education and Training in 2009. He established this particular ministry and it, uh, it did exceptionally well. As a result, he was reappointed by the president of this country, President Jacob Zuma, last year for his second term in the same ministry. So from our side, as higher education, we are so excited to be led by one of our own and we can feel the progress that we are, we are making in the transformation agenda of higher education in this country. He will be with us today because he has to head to a transformation summit that he's convening in Devon because with the past that we've had of apartheid, we are having a huge task in transforming virtually all our operations. But because higher education has to take leadership, Minister Nzimande understands his responsibility and is hard at work. And that conference will be taking place from tomorrow onwards. And for that reason, he will be spending his time with Minister Muridi, but obviously will have to excuse him because he will then have to leave at the end of this day in order to be at the Transformation Summit in Devon. Thank you so much. You are most welcome, uh, Minister Nzimande.